1972 that bright shining future that seemed just over the horizon at the end of the last decade slid into a pit of darkness. Humanity took its last step on the moon, putting an end to dreams of off-world colonies and manned space exploration. The Munich Olympic attack, airport shootings, IRA bombings and many more brought terrorism to the forefront of society and it hasn't left since. Earthquakes killed thousands in Iraq, Nicaragua and Turkey. There is an outbreak of smallpox in Yugoslavia. A million people in the UK are unemployed. The Watergate scandal shakes confidence in the leadership of the US even more than the continually disastrous Vietnam War and will inevitably lead to everybody adding gate to words to denote scandals, something for which there is still no solution. But not everything was dark and depressing. The Godfather premiered a true marvel of cinema and HBO, the first subscription-based television network, goes live. But without dragons, at least for now. Even more relevant to our story is the rise of video games. You had classics like Hunt the Wumpus, a text video game made by Gregory Yobb, where you'd blindly walk from room to room, falling into pits in the hopes of finding and shooting what I imagined is some type of squid, at least according to how it was depicted in Planet Mule. While probably not the most influential game ever made, it was responsible for a lot of references over the next couple of years and can be be seen as a precursor to text exploration games to come. Another adaptation of Star Trek was created, as well as a game called Empire that would soon be renamed to Civilization. No, not that one. It would then have its name changed again to Empire Classic and was a precursor to the 4X turn-based game genre where you command armies, explore your surroundings and attempt to conquer your opponents. And if the year listing on the mainframe is to be believed, this was when another Empire came out, not in 73. Built on the Plato network and still playable through the Cyber One Plato Terminal emulator, it let 30 players at first explore space using Star Trek themed ships with the ability to launch foot on torpedoes, beam people away, tow friendly ships, fire phasers, even orbit planets, all in an attempt to achieve victory. You may think of it as a less depressing EVE Online. Yet these were all games that still needed specialized hardware with special access to that hardware. And here's where the world changed. In 1972, Ralph Baer's idea of a brown box that you could connect to your television and switch to channel Let's Play became a reality for all. Magnavox, an electronic maker that coincidentally sold television sets, agreed to manufacture and sell it in its stores under the name Odyssey. It was a refined version of the brown box, though not a technological leap, still using very basic and easy to manufacture components and not the fancy new kind of integrated circuits that the intels of the world were making these days. It was still a simple system where the players could control at most three squares on a screen and relied on plastic overlays that people had to stick to their television screens in order to compensate for the non-existent graphics. Well, it had three squares. Rules were enforced by the players with no internal methods of keeping score or to maintain order. Even so, there were numerous games built in, although the most relevant one remained the table tennis game, which needed no overlay to be fully enjoyed. The basic version of the Odyssey was really Release for the price of $100 in the US and one with a light gun would be sold separately soon. Adjusted for inflation, that would be just shy of $600, a high price and yet one that some people did decide to pay. According to Ralph Baer, the Odyssey sold nearly 100,000 units within a year, and by the end of its run, it would sell 350,000 units, just enough to make people realize that this could be a thing. It certainly made one man realize it, a man by the name of Nolan Bushnell. 
As the legend goes, Bushnell saw a demonstration of the Odyssey at an event and really liked the table tennis game, though it is quite probable that he had played similar ones in the past considering he was a veteran of space war and even tried to bring it to the masses with computer space. After splitting from Nutting Associates with the intention of making more arcade games, he changed the name of his own venture from CCG Engineering to Atari and hired a man by the name of Alan Acorn. Bushnell gave Acorn a task, meant as training, since he had never developed games before. Elkhorn was asked to make a ping pong game with two paddles, a ball and a scoring system, and he did indeed deliver. The prototype arcade cabinet was put in a bar owned by a friend of Bushnell's and according to legend, it needed servicing very soon. The game was not working because it was filled with too many coins. A good kind of problem. By the end of the year, Atari would build 2,500 units of this game, dubbed Pong. In another year, there were 8,000 of them, each earning close to $40 a day. It was the highest grossing coin operated device ever made. It spearheaded video game arcades and kickstarted the video games industry and that's why it's the game of 1972. Certainly, the games built within the Magnavox Odyssey and the console itself were important for bringing games into the homes of the audience, but people bought it partly because they could play Pong in their homes, or a version of it. There was a symbiotic relationship between the two, helping them both flourish and bringing in millions and millions of dollars. Where there's money, there's interest, and it would soon come in large numbers from larger companies but not before a few lawsuits, because Pong was a bit too much of a copy of Ralph Bear's patents on electronic games. With time, these would be settled, granting Atari a license to use the patents and access to Magnavox's technology in exchange for a hefty fee of $1.5 million. Still, it wasn't really much considering what the arcade cabinets were bringing in and what the next thing would usher forth. But for that, we'll have to wait a week or two. Goodbye.